So we've got with us uh, Martin Mikos, who's the CEO of HackerOne. Uh, it's a company that acts as a platform for uh, hackers and security researchers to get paid for discovering vulnerabilities in the code of its clients. Uh, and then we also have Nate Cardoza with us, who's a senior staff attorney for the Electronic Frontier Foundation, who focuses on cryptography and free speech issues. Um, so it's a, it's a great panel. I'm glad you guys are here. Uh, I want to start off a little bit broad, and then we can get a little bit more granular. Um, so the big question I have is, why do you think we're seeing what seems to be an acceleration of the battle over security and privacy of people's digital information? Well, I think that when we built the internet around 20 years ago, we had just fun stuff there. Today, we have everything on value governed by software and connected to the world. So suddenly, all the organized criminality of the world is hitting at software systems and web systems, and we must protect them. And that's a huge shift. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, we put our entire lives online. Everything we write, every photo we take, all of our relationships, they're all documented online. And until recently, I mean, we're still really bad at computer security. We're barely, we barely understand how to secure, you know, devices like all of you have in front of you and like all of us have in our pockets. We're barely getting started with this. Um, and the fact that companies like Apple are starting to figure it out uh, is causing a challenge for law enforcement that they've never had before. Yeah, so the, to speaking of that, we've got Apple and the FBI. We have uh, the WhatsApp situation in Brazil and Facebook situation in Brazil. So historically, the job of like regulatory agencies, government agencies, was to act as a consumer advocate, protecting their data from, from corporations that would misuse it. And it seems like many companies like Apple are now marketing themselves as champions of data privacy. Do you think we're witnessing the privatization of this consumer data protection model? You know, that's certainly possible. We don't have a robust data protection uh, legal framework in the United States. We essentially don't have one. Uh, the Europeans got out in front and instituted very strong data protection, uh, which we saw sort of fall apart with the safe harbor decision uh, less than a year ago. Um, but in the absence of a regulatory framework, we need something to protect our data. And yeah, I think that's, that's the, the pressure that Apple's reacting to. And Martin, HackerOne deals with clients that range from like Department of Defense on one end to Tor on the other. We have a lot of startups in the audience. What do you think are their most common vulnerable systems? What do you think they need to, to pay attention to first when they start building out their security plans? Yes, we have startups as customers. We have the Department of Defense in the Hack the Pentagon project. We have Uber, General Motors. All of those need protection. And all of them know that there's no organization strong enough so that it does not need the help of hackers. And when you ask, what should you pay attention to in the beginning, you open up your bug bounty program and they will tell you. It's cross-site scripting, it's remote code execution, it's SQL injections, and everybody has vulnerabilities. Every single system that's connected to the world is vulnerable one way or the other. Yeah, either you've been hacked or you don't know it yet, right? Yes, there are yeah. just two possibilities. Yeah. Very true. Um, and are companies, both inside and outside of tech, do you think they're more willing to be open about security now? Because previously, security was very closely aligned with obscurity and secrecy. Right. So you didn't talk about it, or you, yeah. you hid your plans from the public, and now we're seeing a reversal of that with um, you know, external code examination of like open source uh, encryption, stuff like that, and I know the EFF uh, provides an open chart of, of encryption systems and things like that. Do you think companies are more willing now to be open about their security? I think we have a major shift from secrecy and closed systems to open ones. And I was there witnessing the open source revolution 15 to 20 years ago, and now we see the same thing in security where companies realize that the only way to be properly secure is to be open about your vulnerabilities and to invite people you do not know to help you. Uh, I, I, I agree 98% with, with okay. that. Uh, so the, what are the two? So the 2%, the one is Oracle, right? Everybody here, if you haven't read Marianne Davidson's right. blog post, uh, please go read it. You can't find it on Oracle anymore because they deleted it the uh, morning after she posted it. Uh, Marianne Davidson is Oracle's uh, chief security officer, and she essentially said, don't mess with our stuff or we'll come sue you. 
don't even think about submitting a, a vulnerability report. So that's, that's one. There are still companies out there like Oracle who would rather bury their head in the sand than actually produce secure software. Uh, and then the other, the other sort of 800 pound girl in the room that nobody wants to talk about are embedded systems, medical devices, voting machines, automotive. Uh, these companies have never really had to worry about security because they've never had anything with networking. They've never had anything with a radio in it. And now all of a sudden in the internet of things or the internet of some other four letter word, uh, we're, we're you can say internet of shit here, it's, it's okay. It's the internet yeah. of shit. <laughs> uh, you know, we, there, there was an article on Ars Technica the other day about uh, connected cars and how this might be the apocalypse, and that's not wrong, right? Why are we putting radios, why are we putting networking in everything? Um, and the, those companies that have engineering staffs but no security staff don't know what to do with vulnerability report. And in my practice, when, when I'm counseling a, a hacker or a researcher, who's doing vulnerability reporting. The big guys, the software companies, those are, are nearly always seamless, right? Apple knows what to do with the vulnerability report. Even Oracle, who's not great, still knows what to do. Um, but medical device companies, they don't have a freaking clue. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And, and I think in the old security paradigm, people felt that human beings were the problem and tech is the solution. I think we're now learning that actually tech is the problem and humans is the solution. By inviting everybody out there to help you and have a neighborhood watch where they can find your vulnerabilities, it's actually the fastest way to secure a system. Mm -hmm. So we have millions of lines of executable code, there's no way that your staff of 1,500 engineers can vet all of that, because you're not even assigning them to that anyway. Well, if the Department of Defense decides that they are not powerful enough to keep their own system secure without external help, then who can do it? Right, right. Um, there are some corporations that still seem reluctant or resistant to this open dialogue. You know, you mentioned Oracle is one, but uh, Apple's another one, for instance, which they do acknowledge when bugs are submitted and, and solved, but they've resisted an open bug bounty program. Um, why do you think that a lot of these companies are still resistant to it, philosophically? I mean, I was told by a senior you know, Apple security engineer that they, they see both positives and negatives in it, but have decided not to at this time. Yeah. I'm sure you're talking to all these companies. What do you see the, is the most common refrain of like, I don't want to do that? We do, but we don't worry about those who are already take, taking steps towards vulnerability coordination and bug bounty programs, because they are on a journey and they will be good. We worry about, like Nate said, those who have no clue they have no idea that their system is vulnerable. Like when Target was breached, it came through the air conditioning system because it was remotely controlled and nobody had an idea. Mm -hmm. So you need to go and target those who just are completely ignorant of this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I mean, Apple today doesn't have a bug bounty program, but um, as Martin said, they, have, they do have a robust security team and they know what to do with the vulnerability report. Um, but that's Tim Cook's Apple. Steve Jobs' Apple, I think, was much more along the Oracle line. Um, that, that version of Apple didn't produce security white papers, uh, didn't have, uh, in, in their updates, they didn't say what was being fixed or who reported it. It was much more of a black box. So Apple is big, and it's taking them a long time to change, but they're three quarters of the way there, I would say. So. Let's, uh, let's shift it a little bit to encryption for just a second. So we have a lot of discussion about encryption, obviously, and from down from single messaging app to you know big corporations encrypting traffic. Um, the, like the Burr Feinstein bill, you know that was a, a big wake up call to a lot of people. Like, oh wow, people are really clueless about this, and this is dangerous. And so, what do you think the chances are? Something so aggressive, or you know, obviously that's already been kind of tamped down but something so aggressive gets passed by Congress. How clueless is Congress about hacking, encryption, vulnerability? Well, I mean, in this election cycle with this Congress, the chances of anything getting passed are slim to none. Uh, the Burr-Feinstein bill isn't gonna move out of committee, at least not in its current form. Um, I don't know if, if the people in the audience uh, read the bill or read stories about it, but taken literally, the, the backdoor bill that Senators Burr and Feinstein introduced would ban general purpose computers, uh, which could not possibly have been their intent. It just shows how naive they are. Uh, but that was an opening gambit. They, they never intended that draft to pass. 
uh, it's the next draft that we have to worry about. And who, who knows, you know, we, we heard it was gonna be introduced two weeks ago, now we're hearing it'll be introduced the week after next, so who, who the heck knows. One of the common things that people talk about uh, with encryption is, is sort of like the, the right that we all have to private communications, back and forth between one another, messaging and things like that. And that's obviously one of the challenges in, in communicating with the government and saying, hey, look, you know, we understand you need to pursue wrongdoers, but we also have a right to personal communication. But one of the things that I, I find interesting is that that doesn't get talked about as much is the kind of class problem we have of the poorest people, the most disenfranchised people, not having access to systems that are as secure as people who, who have means to afford them. You know, the person who can only buy the $30 Android phone, which isn't encrypted by default. So do you think there's a solution uh, for that problem or a way to move forward in getting everybody the same rights when it comes to encrypted communication? We should do it if it's possible. Yeah, uh, I, I completely agree. I mean, you're right that we have a new digital divide and it's a privacy divide. Uh, and what, what strikes me as most horrifying about the, the Apple FBI debate isn't, isn't just generally the FBI's take that, that they should have access to all of our uh, communications and all of our storage. Any sophisticated actor will continue to be able to use full disk encryption or Signal or PGP or whatever, even if WhatsApp and iMessage go back uh, to non-end-to-end -to -end encrypted. The FBI is really only worried about defaults. They're really only worried about the masses. Uh, and that's going to, going to, to further deepen this digital privacy divide, and that makes me deeply uncomfortable. Um, what are the common refrains of the, of the, by the default, you know, government agencies or uh, people that are oppositional to encryption on the whole, is I don't care about government hacking because I have nothing to hide. So what do you have to say to people who still kind of take that line in supporting these kinds of things? Uh, so my response to I have nothing to hide is it's not about you, right? It, that's a deeply narcissistic uh, position to take. I don't have anything to say, but I still benefit from free speech because everybody else around me has diverse opinions and their right to speak those diverse opinions enriches all of our lives. And privacy is the same way. Um, even if I don't have anything to hide, it's not about me, just like I don't have anything to say. Uh, social movements and democracy and, so, and, and all types of social change from the civil rights movement to the gay rights movement have depended on the ability to organize in privacy free from government surveillance, right? The International Commission of the Red Cross, Red Crescent couldn't do its work in Syria without security, without privacy. Uh, you couldn't have a, a, a gay rights movement anywhere in, in a, a theocratic state without uh, without privacy and security. So it's not about us, right? It's about everybody else. So I don't care if you think you have nothing to hide. It's not about you. You're not that special. <laughs> um, Martin, this is a kind of question for you. When you're advising these companies and you're going to them and saying, hey, here's why you need to open up your code. Here's why you need people, more people to look at yeah. this. Um, are you seeing more and more of these companies think of the government as part of their threat model, something to protect their users from? I think when you build security into a system, you need to protect yourself against any criminal or malicious activity. And although there are different groups, there can be uh, criminal uh, organizations, they can be hacktivists, they can be political organizations, they could be terrorists, they could be nation states. It doesn't really matter for from the perspective of an owner or operator of a web system or the other connected system. You just need to find the vulnerabilities and remove them before they are being maliciously used. So the, for us in the trade, it's important to know where the attack comes from, but for you as building the defense, it doesn't really matter. You need to make, take every step to protect yourself, irrespective of where the threat is coming from. And Nader, you, you, you talk to companies obviously quite a bit when you're kind of uh, negotiating with them and, and helping them out with these legal situations. So are you seeing more willingness to view the government as an oppositional force? Um, sometimes, yeah, uh, especially with messaging companies. The government is definitely seen as an oppositional force. But I mean, it, it's a field of dreams problem because if you collect the data, they will come 
and for values of they that include attackers, organized crime, uh, law enforcement, and intelligence agencies. So if the data is there, you're gonna have to protect it. Um, one way of protecting it, of course, is to not collect it in the first place, which some uh, companies put to, to great use, right? Like WhatsApp doesn't have access to content. That's a great way of keeping all of that content secure. Mm -hmm. And it seems like that model is gonna become more prevalent. The, we couldn't even give it to you if we wanted to give it to you model, right? Yeah, um, that's, what, that's what Apple's development line looks like. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if we saw iCloud go to a zero knowledge solution, at least as an option within the year. And that raises obviously a whole host of technical issues. So is HackerOne kind of preparing for these situations where you're advising companies on zero knowledge systems more and more? Or? We do, although our role is not directly to advise. We do it with our key customers, but we, we are a marketplace of the world's largest community of hackers all over the world, and then all the leading companies who need, need the service of that. So we are like the, sometimes we say we're like the Uber of security because we connect the hackers with the, the companies. So we advise a little bit, but it's not a core part of our business. Uh, we have a, a white paper for online service providers best practice um, that is woefully out of date, but it's still, all the advice in it is still good, it just needs to be updated. And you're, um, you also have a, a kind of um, cheat sheet for messaging systems, right? Which we actually just took down. But oh, yes. okay, good. So you don't have it, but you're putting it back. <laughs> uh, yeah, EFF produces what we used to call the secure messaging scorecard, uh, which we took down last week uh, because we're updating it. And uh, the, the only ETA I can give you is soon. I'm not trying to hide the ball. I actually don't know. <laughs> uh, when the, we, have our, we have a call at 2 o'clock this afternoon to discuss uh, exactly when that'll go up. Um, when you're, the one, one last thing I want to touch on really quickly is that the issue has uh, sort of arisen uh, of a pin code versus fingerprint. I kind of wanted to, to talk to you about that because we just had that case in, in Los Angeles where the court ordered that the person need, could unlock their phone with their fingerprint and they were forced to do that. Yep. And so what's your personal view on biometrics versus uh, you know, pin code authorization for locking your phones? So I actually, I use Touch ID on this device. Um, it's much more robust as an authenticator than a four digit pin or even an eight or 10 digit pin. They say it's probably something like a 12 digit. Um, I turn it off when I go through customs because when on first boot, touch ID doesn't work. That, the Los Angeles court uh, was probably correct. Uh, my former colleague, Marsha Hoffman, wrote an article for Wired in 2012 or 2013, whenever touch ID was first released, discussing the Fifth Amendment implication of touch ID. Uh, and this was exactly the result that she predicted. Um, the Fifth Amendment, for those non-lawyers, which is probably most of you, uh, is the, the right to be free from compelled self-incrimination. I cannot be compelled to turn over my password, except under certain circumstances. I can be compelled to uh, give a breathalyzer test or a, or a uh, blood test for alcohol or provide my fingerprint for a, uh, for a fingerprint comparison and in that same line of cases, we think the argument is pretty good that you can be compelled uh, to put your finger on, on the device. Um, so think about whether you want your thumb or whether you want a different finger. I don't know, just something to keep in mind. <laughs> Got it. All right, thanks folks very much, appreciate it, and uh, thank you for being a good audience. Thank you, Matt. Thanks, Nate. Thanks.